Shalom Bethel family. It is Thursday and time once again for our weekly Torah talk. This week we will uh, review our discussion in Shul that uh, took place this past Shabbat on Parshat Yitro. Now Parshat Yitro is uh, named for Yitro or Jethro, who is Moshe's father-in-law. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity to tell you something about my father-in-law lovely man, Henry Brenzel. And uh, the way we met in a story that he uh, he loves to tell is that Tammy, my wife, was uh, at camp, sleepaway camp, Jewish sleepaway camp, and it was visiting day. And uh, Henry and, and my mother-in-law, Allah HaShalom, uh, Sharon came up to visit. And they set up a nice picnic blanket. They brought up deli or a home-cooked meal. I, I don't remember what it was. And uh, all these friends would come by as they ate their lunch and uh, introduce themselves, say hi, and, and wander off. And then as he tells it, this one guy, kind of funny looking with, uh, with two earrings and big floppy hair, uh, came up to, to their picnic blanket and, and he didn't move on. And so Henry invited him to sit down and, and to eat. And uh, he did. And, uh, and he hasn't left ever since because that young man was me. And uh, that was our introduction. And uh, it's interesting. So uh, my father-in-law, um, and I have a very close relationship. We always have had a very close relationship. And he uh, was there often when I was just starting out. And I would get up. I, in fact, I did my student rabbiing at his synagogue in Milburn, New Jersey. And after I would give a talk, he'd come up to me after and he would say, it was a good talk, Jeffrey, but uh, you're swallowing the ends of your sentences. Or it was a good talk, Jeffrey, but just slow down some or whatever it was. And I would laugh and I would thank him. <laughs> and um, that sounds crazy, but I really appreciated that he was giving me constructive criticism because we had established that kind of relationship. So a similar thing happens with Moshe and his father-in-law in the beginning of this uh, of last week's Parsha. Moshe has done all these miracles or facilitated all these miracles, and the Jews have come out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and now here is Yitro coming to see him. And uh, he sees him judging the people. It says in Exodus 18, 13, and 14 that Moses would judge them from morning until evening, and they were lined up, you know, uh, around the, the tent block uh, all day long as he tried to, to judge. And, you know, he would say, uh, Yitro comes along and he said, what are you doing? Why are all these people standing around all day long? And Moshe said, they, they need to be judged. And he said, what is this thing that you are doing to the people? Why do you sit by yourself while all the people stand before you from morning till evening? Right? It's no good. You think, you know, Dad, I just... I just took these two million people out of Egypt. Don't you think I've got this under control? But no, actually, Moses listens to him and listens to his advice because that's the kind of relationship they formed. And if you look at Rashi's commentary on, on the Parsha, on those passages on Exodus 18.13, it is remarkable what, how Rashi interprets Yitro's criticism. He says, commenting on that Moses sat down and the people stood. He says, he sat like a king and they, everyone who came to be judged, all stood. And the matter displeased Jethro, that he, Moses, belittled the respect due the people of Israel and he reproved him about it. Right, so what was it that, that Yitro was upset about? That Moshe sat like a king while the people had to stand all day long to be judged. What's remarkable about this, among many things, is think about who was the other model for leadership in Moshe's life, right? Who's the other example that Moshe had? Right? Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, right? No one was more likely to sit in the throne while everybody else stood, right? That, that is an equal influence in Moshe's life. Moshe grew up in the palace, seeing that as leadership. 
right? Pharaoh and Yitro are these two huge luminary influences. Yitro was a uh, a high priest of Midian, so he also had his own leadership, um, you know, background and whatnot. But Yitro is the kind of guy who would invite this refugee shepherd into his house, right? Offer him some food. And then he married his daughter and never left, right? just like me when I when I met my father-in-law at camp. Pharaoh saw things a little differently. Pharaoh was the king. Pharaoh wanted order and wanted to always be above the people. Now, sometimes Moshe needs to take that role of being above the people, of being uh, more than that. And sometimes he needs to take Yitro's role. Right? And, and, and listen to the people and be of the people. There's a very powerful lesson there in what and how we should learn from the generations that came before us. Because in Judaism, we have a very strong bias towards the young. Right? The most important generation in Jewish history always is the next one. Right? Always. We are people obsessed with our ongoing survival. We come by that partly because of our difficult history and partly because of our values. But our the importance that we place on youth does not cancel out the value that we place on the generations that came before us. As worshipful we are of the next generation is as respectful that we are of the experience and the challenges that our ancestors faced. Right? That is somewhat different from our modern obsession with youth. And we do live in a culture that is obsessed very much with youth to the detriment of the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom of those who came before us. But Judaism doesn't see it that way. In order to best serve our youth, we need to take the great lessons from those who came before us, put them together in the way to teach them just right, so that the next generation can make it their own. That's what Judaism is, and that's what we learn from Yitro and Moshe in this Parsha. Right? There's a lot that Moshe had to reject from Pharaoh's way of leadership, but not everything. Right? He had to find a way to make that part his own. He certainly had to find a way to make Jethro's part his own. And then he put them together, and there was a new kind of leadership that was Moshe's leadership. And he passed that down to Joshua and to the next generation. And they made it their own again. Judaism is a process that starts way back with Moshe, maybe even back as far as Avraham, but certainly as far back as Sinai, of taking the wisdom and the way that these things are interpreted and making them our own and passing them forward with that new passion and that new creativity to that next most important generation. And because of that as a culture, we are not only worshipful of our youth, we are also incredibly uh, covetous and incredibly um, wrapped up in the lives of those who came before us, of those who we remember. Because we can't send our youth in the right direction unless we uh, take those lessons from those who came before us. Now, this Shabbat in synagogue, we were um, celebrating the, uh, that idea of those who came before us. Um, it was Shabbat Kabed here in Tidewater, here in uh, Hampton Roads. All the synagogues um, spoke on this topic of respecting uh, the previous generations of how we treat our elderly. And it was sponsored by the um, Beth Shalom Village. And uh, that is an amazing institution that's been around between 40 and 50 years here. It started out as a, as a home and then grew into a village when, uh, when other parts were added to it. It's such an amazing organization. And it stands so perfectly for this idea that we don't throw out what's old, and certainly not the older people in our, in our midst, just because we're excited about our youth and what might come next. We, we, we take care. We, we set up a place for them to feel honored, to be active, to get the most out of every minute of life that they have, to be able to live it in the way they want and with the activity they want. And that's what, and that's what uh, the Best Shalom Village provides, so that we as a as a community can move forward in this way uh, of respect. 
that I've been talking about. You know, in Parsha Yitro, we read the Ten Commandments. And in it, we read, Kabed avicha v'yethimecha, honor your father and mother. And when Rashi, uh, I'm sorry, when Ramban interprets that phrase, honor your father and mother, he says, you know, having finished all we owe the Creator, the text turns to deal with his creatures. But if, if you line up the Ten Commandments, you have five on one side that seem to be between uh, God and man, Ben Adam, Le Makom, and five, second part, that is Ben Adam Le Chaviro, between man and man. So on the between man and man part, that makes sense, you know, don't murder, don't steal, don't um, commit adultery, don't lie, don't bear false witness, um, and uh, don't covet. Right, all between man and man. And the first four on the side between man and God make sense, right? I am the Lord your God, don't have any other gods, don't make idols and keep Shabbat. Those are all between man and God. But the fifth one on the side that's supposed to be between man and God is honor your father and mother. Right? So, so what's it doing there? That sounds like mom and dad are people. But only kind of. And Ramban points it out. He says, you know, having finished with all that we owe the Creator, the text turns to deal with his creatures. And it begins with one's father and the one <clears throat> who, uh, begins with the father who is like a co creator with God, informing his descendants. For God is our first father, and the one who sired us is only our immediate father. Right? There is this connection between our parents and our parents' generation. They're just a little bit closer to God than we are. And so they deserve our respect. And so we need to learn from them, not do everything exactly as they did, not agree necessarily with everything that they say, but to find a way to get the value from it, to take those pearls and those gems, put them in the tumbler of our lives so we can pass them forward, polished and beautiful to the next generation. We're grateful that the Beth Shalom village is here to help us do that. And we're grateful to our own um, older generation here at Bethel, who remains so active and is such an inspiration to me and to our community and who continue to point us forward in the right direction. I hope we're all able to, uh, to take those lessons and to live a better life and to raise better children and a better next generation together because, uh, because we take this whole idea so seriously. And with that, I uh, wish you a Shabbat Shalom for this next Shabbat. We'll see you next week.